So in this video, what we are going to be looking at is the transport of water and minerals in the plant. Before we go into the detail of it, what I want to do is I want to give a quick overview of how water and minerals move inside the plant. As you can see here in this diagram of the plant, you can see the root, stem and leaves, right? What needs to happen first is the water and minerals will first enter from the soil into the roots. That's the most obvious thing because that's where absorption of water and minerals take place in the roots of the plant. The second movement is within the root itself. As you can see, I'm showing you the cross section. Where I'm putting the blue dot is where the water and minerals first enter. That is the epidermis. And within the root itself, the water and minerals will have to travel into the xylem. Because only after it enters the xylem, that's when it's able to then move up the stem. Okay, Because the xylem transports the water and minerals. And then from the xylem, it enters the leaf. And in the leaf, the minerals will usually be incorporated into the cell. But what may happen is some of the water vapor inside the leaf will escape the plant through the stoma. That process is known as transpiration. So for this video, I am going to break down the transport of water and minerals in the plants into five sections. Number one, from soil to root. Number two, from the root to the xylem or within the root itself. Number three, up the xylem. Number four, inside the leaf. And number five, water vapor going out of the leaf through the stoma. So what we are going to be doing is we are going to be looking at number one and number two in detail first in this particular video, which is the movement of water and minerals from the soil to root and then of course the movement of water and minerals within the root to the xylem so you can see the cross section of the root right here i'm just drawing it out and you can also see some of the cells within the root as well i'm going to label it okay so if i were to take out that red section you can see the root hair cell those green color cells orange cells and then followed by some green cells and some blue color cells over there those are not the actual colors in the plant. I'm just differentiating them according to colors. So the outermost area, if you remember, are known as the epidermis. Beneath the epidermis, inside the epidermis, is the root cortex, which is the parenchyma tissue. Then you have a single layer of endodermis, followed by the steel. The steel is not important. Don't worry about it. And then it is the xylem vessel element. You know it's the xylem vessel element due to its kind of geometrical i guess you can say this is like an octagon kind of shape and it has those tiny little gap which is known as the pits that's where the water is able to enter into the xylem because the lignin itself is waterproof we are going to be seeing how the water and minerals move from the soil into the root epidermis now so if I'm just drawing out the epidermis, you know that some parts of the epidermis, the cells are specialized. The cell structure kind of forms a finger-like projection that is known as the root hair cell. The function of the root hair cell is to increase the surface area so it can absorb more water and minerals, quite obvious. Now, as you can see here, the soil contains water and minerals. Water I'm representing as blue dots and minerals as red dots. The minerals can be things like magnesium, nitrates, can also be, you know, potassium if it needs so. So, what actually happens first is we need to talk about how do water and minerals enter the root. The first easy way how water and minerals just enter the root is they kind of seep into or get absorbed into the cell wall. This is not a movement by osmosis. The water just moves into an empty space within the cell wall together with the minerals. The reason why minerals move together with water is because minerals can dissolve in water and wherever the water moves, minerals also follow. Now, if you can't imagine this, imagine having a tissue paper and you just put the tissue paper next to a puddle of water you will notice that the water starts seeping into the tissue paper itself. 
okay? So it is, not a, it is not a type of osmosis. This is not osmosis, by the way, because it does not involve a partially permeable membrane and water is not moving down a potential gradient whatsoever. It is just the nature of the cell wall that allows the water to get absorbed into its space. So if a question asks you, how does water and mineral enter the epidermis? The first way you can just say is it moves into the cell wall because the cell wall is freely permeable. Now, another more important way of how water moves into the epidermal cells or the root hair cells is, this one is the more important one that we have to see. Minerals can be transported into the cells by active transport. So as you can see here, I'm just drawing out a pump and the function of the pump is to carry out active transport of the minerals. And we have the mitochondrion inside the root hair cell. The mitochondrion provides ATP. And when the mitochondrion provides ATP for the pump, the pump will then be able to actively transport the minerals from the soil into root hair cell constantly. And it moves the minerals from a low concentration to a higher concentration or against the concentration gradient. What happens then is because the soil has a lower concentration of minerals and the root hair cell has a higher concentration of minerals, what happens to the water potential? The water potential are opposites then. The soil will have a less negative or higher water potential and the root hair cell will have a more negative or lower water potential. Thus, water will then move into the root hair cell through a process known as osmosis down the water potential gradient. So it's as simple as that. So there are two ways in which water and minerals enter the epidermis. It will enter this root epidermis by just getting absorbed into the cell wall, that is not osmosis, or minerals can also enter the cytoplasm of the root hair cell via active transport, and water also gets absorbed into the cytoplasm of the epidermis via osmosis. So these are the two methods where minerals and water enter the root epidermis. So we are done with the first part, okay, where we know that the water and minerals have entered the root epidermis. So movement number two within the root is where water and minerals move within the root cortex. This is where we will have to look at it more in detail. So inside the root, what we are going to be looking at is, I'm going to draw out the root hair cell and I'm also going to draw out a few root cortex, which are parenchyma tissues. So these are the root cortex. You don't have to memorize this diagram. So remember, some of the water and minerals are within the cell wall only. And some of the water and minerals are actually within the cytoplasm or the vacuole of the root hair cell. So let's focus how do the water and minerals move along the root cortex? One way in which the water and minerals move along the root cortex, we are going to focus on the substances in the cell wall. So when they are in the cell wall, they will just start moving within the cell wall to enter the space between the cells and then from the space within the cells, which I'm highlighting in blue, they will still just move along the cell wall, okay? And this is not driven by a potential gradient or a concentration gradient. This is driven by a cohesion or a pull that is happening within the plant. How is this pull produced? I will talk about that later when we are covering transpiration. But for now, all we just have to know is the water and minerals within the cell wall just move within the cell wall, enter the space within the cells, and then just re-enter the cell wall. And they don't technically go into the cell cytoplasm, do they? If you notice the pink arrows, they just remain within the cell wall or the spaces within the cell. This movement is known as something called the apoplast pathway. The apoplast pathway just states that water and minerals move within the cell wall 
and also the intercellular space. The intercellular space is just the space between the cells, which I'm highlighting in blue, and I'm also going to put stars over that. So this is not osmosis at all. However, there is also another way water and minerals can move within the plant. Let's focus on the substances within the cell cytoplasm. From the cytoplasm, they can enter the vacuole. And from the vacuole, what can actually happen? They move out of the vacuole, cross the cell surface membrane and enter another plant cell. And from the other plant cell, cross the membranes and they just move from cell to cell. And then they move within the cytoplasm through the plasmodesma, enter another cell, and then they are just moving from cell to cell, okay? So the water and minerals are moving through this new pathway, also known as the Simplas pathway. The Simplas pathway is the movement of water and minerals across the cell surface membrane, which I've highlighted in green, the vacuole, which I've highlighted in pink, and or the plasmodesma, which I've highlighted in blue. And as you can see there in the diagram as well. So the Simplas pathway involves a partially permeable membrane because the cell surface membrane itself is partially permeable and the vacuolar membrane, which is the tonoplast, is also partially permeable. So this movement is driven by a water potential gradient and also a solute concentration gradient, unlike the apoplast pathway. So there is a so the epidermis has a higher water potential and the deeper parts of the root cortex has a lower water potential. So overall, the water is moving from left to right or from a less negative water potential to a more negative water potential. Now, one common question that students will ask is, uh, do water and minerals only choose the apoplast pathway or the simplast pathway? It can be a combination of the two. Sometimes the water and minerals will commit to the apoplast pathway and then suddenly they enter the simplast pathway and then they will then re-enter the apoplast pathway again. So it's a combination of the two, all right? So we are done with the movement in the root cortex. Now, the next one is we will have to see from the root cortex into the endodermis. If you remember, I told you that the endodermis is a tissue with a single layer of cells and the endodermis cell wall had this substance known as Casparian strip. The Casparian strip is this waxy layer of suberin and I told you that we are going to be talking about the functions later. This is the video where I'm going to be talking about its function. You must know that the Casparian strip is a waxy layer of suberin in the cell wall. Suberin is something that is waterproof. Why is this important? Because when the water and minerals commit into the apoplast pathway, as I'm showing you in the blue arrow, the Casparian strip will block the apoplast pathway. The water cannot cross through the cell wall anymore. So the water and minerals are then forced into the Simplast pathway by crossing the cell surface membrane, which I've highlighted in that pink arrows. It's entering the cell cytoplasm via the Simplast pathway by crossing the cell surface membrane. That is the function of the Casparian strip. All it does is it blocks the apoplast pathway and it forces the water and minerals to enter the Simplast pathway. And from the Simplast pathway, then the water and minerals will then move inside the endodermis. Now, the question here is, why does the plant decide to do such a thing? We are not exactly sure why plants decide to do this, because even after it blocks the apoplast pathway there, later it can recommit to the apoplast pathway if it wants to. Uh, but the assumption is perhaps by, by forcing the water and minerals into the simplast pathway, it gives the plants better control over what they are actually absorbing into the xylem. Because when you involve the cell surface membrane, the cell surface membrane is partially permeable. When something is partially permeable, the cell can actually control what enters the cell or what does not enter the cell. So perhaps that is the function of the Casparian strip. It's to ensure that the plant has better control of, of the amount of water and the type of minerals that it's actually absorbing. So 
from the endodermis then it will then go through the steel the steel is not important and from the steel it will then enter the xylem vessel element so what i'm doing here is i'm going to remove the steel and i'm just going to say that from the endodermis it's supposed to enter the xylem vessel element and you notice that most parts of the xylem vessel element is surrounded by something called lignin. Lignin is this, lignin is this rigid waterproof substance. But there's a certain part of the xylem vessel element where it is not lignified. And that part is the pit, which is a cellulose wall. And it's, the cellulose wall is freely permeable, right? So what just needs to happen is from the endodermis, the water and minerals cross the pit and enter the xylem vessel element. That's all you just have to know about how water and minerals enter the xylem. Simple as that. So to summarize the whole thing, what we just have to see now is water and minerals can first enter the epidermis by getting absorbed into the cell wall or the water can enter the root hair cell via the via osmosis and the minerals enter the root hair cell by active transport. From the epidermis, the water and minerals can commit to something called the apoplast pathway. And from the apoplast pathway, it will then just move through the cell wall and the intercellular spaces. Okay, And from the symplast pathway, it will move through the cell surface membrane, cross the vacuole, and also cross through the plasmodesma. Now, if the water and minerals were moving in the symplast pathway, the moment it goes into the endodermis, it will not have any problems. Problems will only arise in the apoplast pathway because in the endodermis, the apoplast pathway is blocked by the Casparian strip, so the water and minerals have no choice but to enter the symplast pathway by entering the cell cytoplasm. And then from the endodermis, it will just the water and minerals will then just cross through the pit, which is a freely permeable cellulose wall, and it enters the xylem vessel element. That is how water and minerals enter from soil to root hair cell, and from the root hair cell, it will then enter the xylem at the center of the plant. So to just show you what we've done so far, we have already done movement number one and movement number two in the transport of water and minerals inside the plant.